It was a late summer day in 85 BC. Roman commander Lucius Cornelius Sulla stood with his back to his base camp, where some 20,000 of his soldiers quartered. Across the plain among the Boeotian hills stood another, larger camp. In it, the Pontic general Archelaus was closely monitoring his every move. Sulla knew the Pontic army outnumbered his army nearly five to one. With Mount Hedilium and the swamps in his back, and part of his infantry already battered by an earlier cavalry charge, he did not have much choice but to fight to the death. He ordered his infantry to dig trenches and prepare for the inevitable battle. This time, the deciding factor would not only be bravery and combat skill, but cunning and strategy. In 86 BC, a major war waged on in the eastern border of the Roman Republic. The rogue king Mithridates of Pontus had annexed and bullied smaller Roman client states before invading Greece under the pretense of liberating the Hellenistic world from the Roman yoke. One Roman commander in particular, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, rose to the task of ejecting Pontus from Greece. With considerable success, that summer at his headquarters in Pergamum, Mithridates received news that unnerved him significantly. At Cheronea, his mighty force of over 80,000 soldiers was defeated by Sulla, who commanded perhaps a third of that. Despite the enormous loss and tongues claiming only betrayal could have caused such a defeat, Mithridates acted resolutely. The first thing he did was raise taxes in Asia Minor, conscripting and hiring another massive army which did not do under for the one defeated at Charonia. Despite his victory, Sulla too felt the heat. A factional dispute within Rome was gliding towards civil war. His enemies, personified by Gaius Marius, had entrenched themselves in powerful positions in Rome. As a result, Rome became dangerous for Sulla's supporters. Many fled the city. Around this time, news that worried both Mithridates and Sulla reached them. Rome declared Sulla an outlaw and dispatched a separate army commanded by Lucius Valerius Flaccus to wage a separate war against Mithridates and to deal with Sulla. Thus, the extraordinary situation of a potential three-way war developed. Mithridates' large army received the task to link up with Archelaus, who lost at Cheronea, and to defeat Sulla once and for all. A large fleet brought them over to Chalcis. Here they linked up with Archelaus, who had killed time with piracy until then. Within several months, the brand new army reached the scene of the defeat at Cheronea. They seized Boeotia with the support of a local popular uprising against the Romans. When Sulla received news of the Pontic seizure of Boeotia, he decided he had to deal with the Pontic threat before he could deal with Flaccus's Roman army. However, Archelaus learned from his previous defeat and he was well aware of Sulla's predicament. As such, he delayed the inevitable battle using scouts to evade Sulla's army and never traveling through areas where Sulla's army excelled. Time was running out for Sulla. He decided to take the gamble and send a message to Archelaus. In it, he proposed to him one final or nothing battle. Sulla set up camp about 15 miles north of the town of Orcomenos. To his east, the valley stretched some 30 miles, mainly consisting of marshes. The Pontic generals decided to take the bait and set up camp nearby. Snuggled between hills, but with a wide open plain, it was definitely good ground for the Pontic cavalry. Together, the generals commanded some 90,000 soldiers eager to avenge the previous defeat. Sources estimate in total they commanded around 10,000 horsemen and 80,000 infantry soldiers. The generals made sure to be wary of swamps that encompassed the plain. Meanwhile, Sulla commanded no more than 20,000 soldiers. He faced daunting odds. He also noted the marshes around the plain and ordered his men to dig trenches to funnel the Pontic army towards them or to simply break the cavalry's effectiveness. But as the Roman infantry began digging, Archelaus understood he had to act fast to maintain his advantage. So he ordered the Pontic cavalry to charge straight at them. Well, seeing 10,000 horsemen charge at them, the Romans fled in a panic. Sulla rode around between his men, trying to rouse them to fight. When the lines remained chaotic, he dismounted his horse, picked up a dropped banner and shouted, 
Romans, I win an honorable death here with you. When they ask where you betrayed your commander, you will have to tell them about Orchomenos. This sign of bravery by Sulla was enough to have the fleeing Romans stop in their tracks, turn around, and face the charging Pontic cavalry. The cavalry smashed into the standing Romans, and ferocious fighting ensued. Many soldiers were slain during the chase, and even more as they made a stand against the cavalry. But they held out long enough for two Roman cohorts to reinforce their lines. The battle now became stagnant, and stationary cavalry wasn't nearly as effective as when in charge. The Roman infantry slowly gained the upper hand against the horsemen, and it is likely that during this skirmish the Romans slew Archelaus' son. In the rear, Pontic archers tried to support their cavalry, but after a brutal battle and rapidly losing and being put on the back foot, the horsemen saw no other option but to retreat. As the cavalry withdrew, many archers were suddenly exposed and faced Roman infantry attacking them. With virtually no distance between them, they fought with bundled arrows as improvised swords. But of course, lightly armored Pontic archers were no match for the veteran Roman soldiers. So with mounting casualties, those who survived too retreated to the Pontic camp. When Archelaus returned to the Pontic camp, Sulla immediately gave his men the order to dig ditches. This time, Archelaus ordered his entire army to leave the camp and march onto the Roman positions. He positioned his scythe chariots in the vanguard, followed by his phalanx. Behind the phalanx followed the slaves who fought at Charonia, this time with armor and weaponry similar to that of Roman auxiliaries. The flanks of his army were manned by the cavalry who weren't in an ideal position for Sulla's funnel ditch, as it would hamper their charge significantly. In return, Sulla ordered his army in three separate lines. There was space between the lines, so Roman cavalry or light infantry could rush to the aid if need be. His front line stood far in front of the second two lines. It was peculiar positioning, and Archelaus would soon find out why. Seeing the Romans take their positions, he ordered the scythe chariots to charge into the Roman front lines. But just as it happened at the Battle of Charonia, the Roman infantry was disciplined enough to simply step aside as the Roman chariots approached. Them stepping aside revealed thick wooden stakes at an angle towards the approaching chariots. The men on the chariots saw too late they were running into a severe killing field. Those unfortunate enough not to turn around in time crashed into the stakes. And if the stakes and the horrific crash did not kill them, they would surely succumb to the hill of javelins thrown by the Romans. Screams arose from behind the Roman front lines, as the riders were pelted with Pila until none of them survived. But not all chariots crashed into the stakes. Some of them managed to swerve around before the Roman front lines, probably expecting the exact same maneuver as the Romans had pulled at Charonia. However, the phalanx was already approaching in their rear, expecting to find a better Roman front line for easy picking. Instead, the phalanx faced allied chariots now racing towards them in a panic. The chariots indeed did do a lot of damage, but unfortunately, not to the enemy. The phalanx suffered incredible damage from the panicked fleeing chariots. Sulla too saw his plan had worked, and now he ordered his infantry forward. Archelaus understood he was losing momentum and ordered his cavalry to charge as a Hail Mary. Hopefully the time the charge would buy him would lead to his phalanx recollecting themselves. Now, charging horsemen were dangerous for infantry. As such, Sala ordered his vastly outnumbered cavalry to charge as well. He hoped they would stop the Pontic horsemen in their tracks and hold them aground for long enough until the infantry caught up. They would then be able to deal with the stationary cavalry. Heavy combat broke out between both cavalries, and the Romans were initially put on the back foot. But unfortunately for Archelaus, Sulla was right. By the time the Roman infantry caught up, the phalangites were still not battle ready. Instead, Archelaus decided to have his phalanx retreat to the camp while his cavalry held off the advancing Romans. The phalanx was in no state to fight, they were heavily damaged by the Allied chariot disaster. As a result, his stationary cavalry holding back the Romans suffered heavy casualties against the infantry. They kept up the fight for a brief while until they too fled to the base camp. The first day of battle came to an end. By the time the night fell, the battlefield had quieted down. Archelaus ordered Pontic soldiers to collect their dead. They suffered 15,000 casualties already. Sulla's army suffered not even a fraction of that. 
That night, the Roman commander realized he had put his enemies on the back foot. His number of deaths was significantly lower than the Pontic army, but he was well aware the Pontic army still outnumbered his. As the sun rose, he ordered his army to decimate their adversaries. Initially, the infantry constructed earthworks some 200 meters from the Pontic camp. Then the Roman army marched forward, while the Pontic defenders hastily tried to take their positions to fight the Romans. The two armies approached each other and stopped briefly across without a word being said. Appian describes what happened next. A Roman soldier dashed out and chopped down the man in front of him. Then all hell broke loose. There was a great rush and shouting on each side followed by many valiant deeds. Though unclear in which direction, the Pontic army was pushed back towards the marshes. Before too long, the Pontic infantry really was stuck between the swamp on the one side and the Roman infantry on the other side. Many either drowned or became stuck and were slain by Romans eagerly hacking away at the helpless men. The soldiers ran deep into the swamps in an attempt to escape. It appeared Archelaus was killed during the fleeing frenzy. It was not so much a battle anymore but a massacre as the Pontic army was unable to defend themselves against the frantically fighting Roman soldiers. Any soldiers who surrendered were slain anyway as Sulla had no use for prisoners. According to Plutarch, even two centuries after the battle had taken place, people still discovered swords and breastplates in the swampy territories. The massacre continued throughout the entire day. Pontic soldiers fled wherever they could and Roman soldiers gave chase anywhere they were not at risk of drowning in the swamp. As night fell, the battlefield lay littered with corpses. The next morning, most if not all of the survivors who had hidden were slain and Sulla ordered his army that they were to embark on another campaign in Greece it was not until dawn, two days after the battle was over, that the swamp's reeds moved involuntarily. Archelaus emerged from the wetlands. The general hid there for two days until the Romans finally abandoned the battleground. He survived the battle, but he undoubtedly worried about how his king would take the news of this second massive defeat. With his decisive victory, Sulla ordered the construction of monuments and ornaments to commemorate the occasion. He also allowed his men to raise Boeotia, taking revenge for their willingness to submit to Mithridates. News reached him of Flaccus, who marched through Thracia on his way to deal with Sulla. Sulla probably rightfully estimated he would not be able to continue the fight against Mithridates as his enemies became ever more entrenched in Rome. A unique situation developed. Because Mithridates too understood Sulla's predicament, it is nothing short of ironic that Flaccus's Roman army was his best bet at getting rid of Sulla. To have Sulla consider attacking Flaccus, he neutralized the entire Pontic threat in Greece. All garrisons were withdrawn and Archelaus ended any naval piracy. Flaccus's army was suffering its own trouble. As Sulla set up winter camp in Thessaly, Flaccus figured he would subject his men to a winter march to meet the outlaw general in battle. But Flaccus was a politician, not a military man. In fact, most of the military advice was given by a legate accompanying him, Gaius Flavius Fimbria. The thing is, Flaccus did not listen to Fimbria whatsoever. By the time his army reached Thessaly, Flaccus was hated by his soldiers and by Fimbria himself. They hated him enough to assassinate him. Instead of attacking Sulla, Fimbria once again took his army back to Asia Minor. Unprepared, Mithridates' territories could not adequately deal with the Romans wreaking havoc. Instead of vying to get rid of Sulla, concluding peace suddenly became all the more pressing to the king. So he sent Archelaus to conduct negotiations with Sulla. The negotiations took place in a Roman camp close to Delian. Both men were itching to get the war over with and attend to different matters. In the end, Archelaus agreed to take Sulla's terms to Mithridates, which were nothing short of capitulation. He had to sacrifice most conquered territories in Asia Minor, give Sulla 70 ships and pay indemnities. The king refused Sulla's terms, much to his anger. Archelaus tried to convince Mithridates this was, in fact, his best bet at keeping his head attached to his body. In the background, Fimbria's army was still ravaging Asia Minor. 
Having to feed a sizable army, Fimbria decided to besiege Pergamum, one of the wealthiest areas and the location of Mithridates' court. Another significant military disaster followed, with Fimbria ambushing most of Mithridates' mercenaries and levies before they even got a chance to put up a real fight. Fimbria began preparing the besiegement of Pergamum, a dangerous position to be in for the fallen from grace king. Accepting his less than favorable situation, Mithridates retreated to Pitani, awaiting his fleet to take him back to Pontus. But at the worst possible time, Lucius Licinius Lucullus's fleet arrived in the region. This requires some explanation. Now, this Lucullus had been dispatched to Alexandria in 86 BC, before the Battle of Chaeronea. Sulla ordered him to gather a fleet as the siege of Athens commenced. That was well over a year ago, and as far as Sulla was concerned, Lucullus had not succeeded in his dangerous mission. But he did succeed, albeit in an untimely manner. Fimbria's troops were rapidly advancing on the shores. Fimbria asked Lucullus to block Mithridates' escape. They would quickly finish the war and Mithridates would soon meet his end. However, Lucullus remained loyal to the outlaw Sulla and informed Fimbria he would do no such thing. The direct result was Mithridates simply sailing away from the harbour through Lucullus' blockade. There is no doubt Fimbria flew into an impotent rage. Lucullus then turned around to pick up Sulla from his camp to conduct peace negotiations in person. In late 85 BC, Mithridates and Sulla met nearby Troy. The talks between them were a great display of showmanship. In the end, they sealed the peace of Dardanus with a kiss. Mithridates agreed to withdraw from Bithynia, Cappadocia and Paphlagonia. Their former kings were reinstalled as Roman clients. He also paid a fine of 2,000 talents, turned over 70 ships and 500 archers. In return, the king got to keep his head and even received the dubious title of Rex Socius et Amicus, Rome's ally and friend. After establishing peace, many of Fimbria's legions deserted to Sulla, who was nothing short of a living legend. Finally, when even his closest advisors left him, Fimbria took his own life. Thus, the thorn in both Mithridates' and Sulla's side resolved itself. Frankly, in the big scheme of things, the established peace was nothing short of a truce. It was in both Sulla and Mithridates' mutual interest to pause the bloodshed temporarily while I attended to different matters. The peace was the first chapter's end of a war that would involve multiple generations. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a battle, topic or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to exclusive patron videos. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.